Chimere is a distant planet. It is defined by waves of life brought from Earth and set free to evolve independently in this new context. The indigenous life of this planet, swarms of microbes called magic by the people who live there, are what harvest Earth organisms and make copies on Chimere. Since the late Jurassic, birds and anurognathid pterosaurs have competed for the niche of insect specialists. Generally speaking, birds took the day, while anuronathids ruled the night. Although the first bats arrived in Chimera during the Oligocene, it was not until the aftermath of the dynastic extinction that they saw widespread success, while many of the competing pterosaur species were killed off and the playing field was leveled. Birds still dominate the diurnal insect specialist niche. A few diurnal anuronathids pterosaurs have held on, but most hunt alongside bats at night. Echolocation may not be as potent as it is often reputed to be, but it is a great advantage. Even so, anuronathids have held on strongest in the nocturnal insect niche, especially in the temperate zones, with their massive and acute eyes making up for their lack of echolocation. Bats do not enjoy their dominion of the night as they do on Earth, but there are still around 50 species in the known world alone. The common or brown bat is a species of myotis that, as its name suggests, has a wide range and extremely high population, making up as many as 20% of all bats in the known world. They are a fairly recent arrival from Pleistocene Southeast Asia. They hunt insects at night in massive colonies, sometimes numbering in the millions. Although most common in the caves of the Crescent and Southern Arvel, they will roost in trees, sloth dens, and chimeran settlements. Like others of their genus, they have unusually long lifespans, sometimes well into their 40s. This long life having offspring throughout most of these years seems to be a contributing factor in their rapid success. The golden bat is another common species, one far more ancient and chimere. They are one of the fastest animals in the known world, able to reach bursts of speed of up to 120 miles per hour in the pursuit of insects. These bats are especially common in the Housie Prairie, roosting in the caves of mesas and abandoned termite mounds before journeying out to the prairie to feast on the smorgasbord of insects which congregate at night. They also live in enormous colonies, and reports of colonies so vast that the setting prairie sun is blocked is often spoken of by Shu as an ill omen. And urinated pterosaurs are their steepest competition, although these little critters tend to not reach nearly the numbers of the common golden bats. They are extremely swift and agile. In general terms, the anuronathids tend to fare better and in some cases competitively exclude echolocating bats from forested habitats, while bats have outcompeted the pterosaurs in open territory. For example, the Mordecai, or Pacardiant Batwing Owl, has displaced most echolocating bats from Picardia and the southern islands, being predominantly forested habitat. Frugivorous bats, like the flying fox, also face competition that they do not on Earth. A clade of adapiform primates, the flying lemurs, are gliding fruit specialists that thrive in open forests. They are gliders and not true flyers, and therefore are more efficient in how much food they need and this has proven advantageous in the long run. The Picardiant Oromora is not only the largest bat in Chimere with a wingspan of up to 7 feet, it is also the only known bat to be tamed and kept as pets. While the Karakai firebirds might be superior for hunting, many Karatoan prefer using Oromora as they tend to be more obedient and their greater size means that they can intimidate larger game, flushing them towards a good shot. Though they have not technically been domesticated, tame individuals are popular companions, and in the folklore, they represent teamwork and playful temperament. Many other animals, aside from bats, have converged upon this body plan. Given the prominence of bats in the known world, the assumption that many of these creatures were homunculi is a reasonable one, and it is only in recent times that many of these myths were dispelled. The flying lemurs and pterosaurs in general are often mistaken for hybrids with bats, and the term is loosely applied to all tetrapods with membranous wings. 
The clade of multituberculates have long been fruit and small game specialists of Kairul, the eastern continent, and came to the known world around 12 million years ago. These include the flying gophers and flying cats, both of which possess venomous spurs and shearing molars. While flying gophers are more common and successful, especially in the Titan Gardens, the flying cats are actually capable of powered flight. While only one species in the known world is the size of a small cat, the forests of Kairul are home to much larger species, some of which are comparable in size to a panther. A recent arrival from the distant Permian Islands is the Vanyu, a therocephalian that spits a venom toxic to mammals. They are, like the flying cats, quite small. According to rumors, the top predators of the islands are enormous versions of the Vanyu, and some even claim that the indigenous peoples of the island ride upon them as massive therapsid dragons, which fortunately for the known world, are allegedly only capable of short distance flight and cannot cross the equatorial ocean of storms to the north. Although these are all natural animals, the reputation of them being enchanted hybrids with bats is not entirely unfounded. During the period of history when the first children took refuge in the highlands of Picardia, they often made their tunnels of Hukulgor their home. They enslaved the mines of these great sloths and used them to make tunnel homes. It was here that the first children encountered the Sarkomora, or giant vampire bat. When the sloth Lustadon came to Chimer from South America during the Miocene, they were accompanied by a parasitic bat which fed on their blood. As Lustadon went from around 2 tons to 6, and even 12 in the cases of especially large male Hukogor, so too did their parasite increase in size. The Sarcomora can attain a wigspan over 3 feet, or 1 meter, and feeds almost exclusively on the blood of Hukogor sloths. Being one of the most successful large mammals of the known world, these bats have ample food. While they were not a threat to the first children, they were quite popular and inspirational, and became a common subject of the first homunculi. The efficiency of processing a liquid diet seems to have appealed to them, and even later stage homunculi often incorporate elements of the sarcomora while feeding from mortal hosts. Vampire bats have a long-standing association with the first children, being common in their heraldry. Although they sometimes target livestock, they are not common near settlements, and cats and dogs are generally reliable deterrents. Even so, they have fed on livestock and chimerians enough times that they are deeply hated by most peoples and hunted aggressively when they do make an appearance. Overall, however, Bats are generally well regarded by chimerians. Farmers have long considered them good luck for hunting the insects which threaten their crops. Although not the megafauna that capture the wonder of visitors to this realm of giants, many bats are critical members of the ecological caste and keystone species in the environments of the known world and beyond. Happy Bat Appreciation Week, everyone! As you may have noticed, I have been absent from making episodes in an effort to finish my latest anthology, the completion of which took longer than I anticipated. This book, Songs of the Inland Sea, will feature a range of short stories and novellas all in the context of water, including a heist on a ship that goes horribly wrong, and a survival story told from the perspective of a killer whale. While the book is complete and I'm hoping for a November 1st release, it all depends on when my author copy arrives and gets approved, so it may be a bit longer. I appreciate you all's patience on the matter. Best believe there will be a lot of promotional episodes when it's ready, including a special on the anthology itself, the animals you will meet within its pages, and an exploration of the Kaishelin Silent Ones. Thank you all so much for hanging in with me, for your support both on Patreon and by watching these episodes, and I will see you next week on Halloween for a special haunted episode that I am unspeakably excited for. That's all for today. Cheers, folks!